Okay, I'd like you to turn now in your Bible to John chapter 3. Beginning with verse 31, we read, He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth is from the earth and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. What he has seen and heard of, that he testifies. And no one receives his testimony. He who has received his testimony has set his seal to this, that God is true. For he whom God has sent speaks the word of God, for he gives the Spirit without measure. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. He who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. I just want us to have a look at verse 34 in particular. It says, For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for he gives the Spirit without measure. There's a slight difficulty for us in the study of this verse, in that when he says, For he whom God has sent, who is Jesus, of course, speaks the words of God. Um, for he, the second he here is, it seems natural to just read it as Jesus gives the spirit without measure. But we can't read it that way because to give the spirit to anyone without measure is to make them God. It is to consider them God because the spirit of God fills God, fills everything. The Spirit of God knows the mind of God. The Spirit of God is God. So, in the King James Version, and other versions suggested, and all the commentators suggested, that what has to be understood here is that the, the second he refers to God who is true, who gives the Spirit without measure to him. They've added that in, to him, who is Jesus. But it absolutely fits the context because the very next verse says, the Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hands. So to give the Spirit to Jesus without measure is, of course, he, he was God who came down into the flesh. It was that as a fleshly man that he would have received the Spirit without measure. And that was the Father's gift to him. In him, all the fullness of deity dwelt in bodily form, we're told in Colossians uh, chapter 2 and in verse 9. So it's, it's that connection. It's, it's that understanding of giving the Spirit to Jesus that he is God in the flesh and without measure. There was no limitation on the spirit that was given. But it also has a, a, an implication in it. If God the Father gave the spirit to Jesus without measure, then there is an implication that to everyone else who received the spirit, it is given by the Father by measure. Everyone who receives the Spirit receives it by measure. Without measure, by measure. Without measure for Jesus, by measure for the rest of us. Now that's important because there's so much confusion about the subject of the Spirit of God and receiving the Spirit of God and what the Spirit of God does for us. 
and particularly in the area of the um, Pentecostal groups which have proliferated now all over the world and have established themselves very firmly on the religious scene. They are teaching, of course, that the spirit is our possession, that miraculous gifts are still in vogue, that speaking in tongues is the big, is the big deal in terms of your religious experience. And we, as Christians, need to understand how we can explain this subject in a simple way, but in a scriptural way, to everybody who is deluded by the teachings that are going on in the present day religious world. In Acts chapter 2, a very familiar passage to us, Acts chapter 2, Peter preaches, the, the, the apostles receive the Holy Spirit, uh, it, it comes down on them visibly in tongues of fire, and uh, there had been a mighty rushing wind, which the people of Jerusalem had heard, the tongues of fire could be seen, and they were speaking in tongues or languages of the people that had come from all over the world to uh, be there in Jerusalem for the great festival of Pentecost. So here, geez, Peter now preaches to this group of people. They thought they were drunk when they were hearing them, some of them at least thought they were drunk when they were hearing them speaking in tongues or speaking in different languages. But Peter explains, no, it's only the third hour of, hour of the day. It's hardly likely that we're going to be drunk. Uh, they were, may have been drunk with the spirit, but they weren't drunk with alcohol, that's for sure. And then he goes on to preach about Jesus uh, and who Jesus is and what Jesus has done for us to save our souls. And he ends up by telling them that... Uh, uh, it was not David who ascended into heaven, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Verse 35. Therefore let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. So this was a crucial, crucial message. It was now the first gospel sermon after Jesus had died, was buried, was resurrected again and had ascended into heaven and now the consequences of all of what he did was being offered to the people before people, before Peter and they said when they, it said, the Bible says here when they heard this they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brethren what shall we do? Peter said to them, repent and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now that's straightforward enough, isn't it? What did they have to do to receive the Holy Spirit? Well, they had to do the same thing <coughs> that they had to do in order to receive the forgiveness of sins. So maybe I should ask you then, what did they have to do? Look at the passage again. What did they have to do to receive the forgiveness of sins? They had to repent and be baptized. What did they have to do then in order to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit? They had to repent and be baptized. They already had believed. They were pierced to the heart in their belief that they had crucified the Savior. And they wanted to know what God wanted them to do. And he told them, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That we receive this gift after hearing and believing 
is confirmed in other passages of Scripture. Let's look in Ephesians chapter 1, 13 and 14. He reminds the Ephesians about what happened in the early days for them when they became Christians. In him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Now notice it was a particular message. Again, I want to emphasize what the Bible is emphasizing. It was a particular message. Not some harangue from some preacher about what he thinks or what he believes or what they should do and what scheme he has got in his head. This had to do with the preaching or the listening to the message of truth which was the gospel of their salvation. It is the gospel that brings the salvation. It is the gospel that's the message of truth and it's that gospel that we have here for us in the New Testament. It's all about Jesus Christ and what God is doing for us through Jesus Christ, his son and our saviour. After hearing the gospel, he says, having also believed. What did they believe? They believed the gospel. They didn't believe anything other than the gospel. They didn't believe that the law of Moses. They didn't believe anything else but the gospel. And you were sealed in him after they believed. You were sealed in in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, he says, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. To the praise of his glory. So, the Holy Spirit that we receive when we believe, repent and are baptized is given to us as a pledge other passages of scripture talk about it as a down payment, as it were, for what you are going to receive, for the gift that you're going to receive, eternal life. And here then is this, the reason for the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. It makes us, it gives us a share in the life of God and it is a pledge from God that all that has been promised through the Spirit of God, will be fulfilled in us if we continue to be faithful. In Galatians chapter 3 and in verse 2, Galatians, just turn a few pages back there, Galatians chapter 3 and in verse 2, the Galatians, of course, were turning away from the gospel. They were being lured away to accept that the law of Moses, that circumcision, and all that is commanded in the law of Moses needs in it to be applied in their lives in addition to believing in Jesus Christ our Lord and walking according to Christ's will. So Paul asks them this question. He says, this is the only thing I want to find out from you. Did you receive the Holy Spirit by the works of the law? Or by the hearing with faith? Now, the, the Galatians were expected to answer that. When you were under the law of Moses, did you receive the Holy Spirit under the law of Moses? The answer to that was no. When you heard the gospel and believed the gospel and obeyed the gospel, did you receive the Holy Spirit then? Yes, we did. Well, he wanted to know then, why is it that having begun in the Spirit, because the Spirit being given to us, and the Word of the Spirit and the truth is all connected together, if, if we walk by the truth of the Gospel, if we walk by the Spirit of, God, of Jesus Christ our Lord, if we start out that way, how do we then say, having started out that way and saying by doing that, that we are justified by walking in the Spirit, how are we going to go back to the flesh and the mind of the flesh and say, no, no, now we're, now we're justified by what we think and what we do and the fleshly things that we do. 
But the Spirit was given after the hearing of faith. After the hearing of faith. That's the point I want to emphasize here. After the hearing of faith. It's referred to, this reception of the Spirit is referred to as the dwelling uh, of the Spirit. In Romans chapter 8 verse 9. He's reminding the Romans as well about this contrast between the flesh and the spirit. However, he says, you are not in the flesh. Now, we are in flesh. But the flesh is not governing our lives anymore. The fleshly thoughts and needs and emotions and so forth is not governing our lives anymore. The spirit of God is governing our lives now through the word of truth. The gospel of our salvation. That's what's governing us. So in that, that sense we're not in the flesh. We're in the spirit. However he says you are not in the flesh but in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. That's the spirit of God whom you received when you were baptized. He needs to continue to dwell in you. And it's the indwelling of the Spirit and, and that he's talking about here. So what I'm saying is that we receive the Spirit of God by measure. And let's call it the indwelling of the Spirit measure. So that we can distinguish it from other measures. This is the indwelling of the Spirit measure. In 1 Corinthians... Chapter 3, 16 and 17. He says this. Do you not know that you are a temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? Think about the analogy here. The Jews understood the temple and Gentiles, because they came from a heathen background, also understood temples. Temples were sacred places. They were where the gods dwelt, according to the heathens, or where God dwelt, according to the Jews. You have become the temple of God. Now, in that society, that would have meant a lot. It would mean that I am a sacred dwelling place for God. Do you not know that you are a temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If any man destroys the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy and that is what you are. We receive the Holy Spirit we are supposed to be living in accordance with the spirit that is in us and that is a Holy Spirit. We are to be a holy people like God, like Jesus Christ our Lord. All of the sinful attributes that we have and the weaknesses in the flesh and the desires for what is wrong, all of those things, we need to be fighting against those things on a daily basis. That's what this all means. It is inconsistent with the high calling with which we have been called, with the status that we have as temples of God for us to be defiled and unclean in our lives. Now, I realize just as much as anybody that we have a struggle. And that we fail quite often, too often. But what, what, uh, what I suppose gets to me is how comfortable we are with our failings. And how, how, uh, how we're not just comfortable, but we won't even reproach ourselves for our failings. We just feel that this is just the way it is. This is me. 
and uh, and I don't want to be too hard on myself and and uh, and so I, I just accept what I now think is the norm it's not the norm as a Christian you have changed you are a different person you are a new creation in Christ Jesus our Lord the Spirit of God dwells in you we are to make efforts to rid ourselves of the defilements of the flesh and spirit and to serve God in holiness and in righteousness all the days of our lives. In 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 14 God remind, or Paul reminds Timothy He says, guard through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us the treasure which has been entrusted to you. I've been responsible, or I am responsible to guard the treasure that has been entrusted to us. What is the treasure? The treasure is the gospel. The treasure is the gospel and the spirit of God and the spirit of righteousness and truth. I've got to, I've got to guard it. I'm responsible for it. If you were given a diamond ring to mind for somebody until they got, uh, maybe you've been asked to mind it by a man who's going to get engaged in a few weeks, uh, and this was a very expensive thing, would you not feel responsible? Would you just be throwing it here and there? or taking it out and showing it to everybody, would you not feel some sort of responsibility to protect it, to take care of it, and to ensure that you'll have it to give to the person when they need it? Is that not your responsibility if you've taken the responsibility on? Of course it is. All who are baptised then receive the indwelling of the Spirit or the indwelling measure of the Spirit which God has promised to all those who will obey Him. now to consider the miraculous measure of the Spirit. We've got to now have grasped what the indwelling of the Spirit is and how we get it. But we're going to see that the miraculous measure of the Spirit is something different. And in order to help us to see that, let's go to Acts chapter 19. Verses 1 through 7. Acts chapter 19, 1 through 7. Paul gets to the city of Ephesus. And it happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the upper country and came to Ephesus and found some disciples. Now this is interesting, so pay attention. He said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Now notice how that, how that impinges on this indwelling. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? It was after hearing and believing, repenting and being baptized, that the people received the indwelling of the Spirit. But these disciples said, um, in reply, said to him, No, we have not even heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. He knew there was something wrong now. Uh, they knew there was something wrong. And he said to them, Into what then were you baptized? He knew there was something wrong with the baptism. Because had they been baptized as Peter commanded, they would have known that they would receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. 
It says, and uh, we have uh, not even heard whether there is a Holy Spirit, and he said, into what were you baptized? And they said, into John's baptism. So although John's baptism was correct when John was preaching it and when John was around, it was only a temporary measure to point to Christ and Christ's baptism. Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in him who was coming after him, that is, in Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of of the Lord Jesus. All right, now we just stop there for a minute. Given all that we said about the indwelling of the Spirit and how they would receive the indwelling of the Spirit, did these people, when they were baptized in the name of our Lord Jesus, and it implies that they believed in our Lord Jesus Christ, it implies they were leading a repentant life, did they now, when they were baptized, receive the indwelling of the Spirit? Yes, they did. Yes, they did. But something further, something beyond that happened now in verse 6. When Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they began speaking with tongues and prophesying. And there were in all about 12 men. In addition to the indwelling measure of the Spirit, Paul now lays his hands on these 12 disciples, 12 Christians, who he then imparted through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he imparted the miraculous measure of the Spirit to them. Alright? Do you understand that? He imparted through the laying on of the apostles' hands. And we can put a heading on this one saying, the laying on of hands, or the apostles' hands measure of the Spirit. The laying on of hands measure of the Spirit. We'll, we'll, we'll understand that it is the apostles who were able to do this. Um, these people realizing that they had not been baptized in the baptism of the Great Commission were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And then Paul laid his hands on them and they received the miraculous measure of the Spirit. And that was proved because they were speaking in tongues and prophesying. They were speaking in tongues and prophesying. Let's go to Acts chapter 8 now. This is in the city of Samaria. And it says, Now there was a man named Simon who formerly was practicing magic in the city and astonishing the people of Samaria, claiming to be someone great. And they all, from smallest to greatest, were giving attention to him, saying, This man is what is called the great power of God. Quite a, quite a, a title for a man. And they were giving him attention because he had for a long time astonished them with his magic arts. And when they believed Philip preaching the good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were being baptized men and women alike. Even Simon himself believed, and after being baptized he continued on with Philip as he observed signs and great miracles taking place. He was constantly amazed. Now these signs and miracles were taking place through Philip and he was absolutely amazed at what he saw because he knew he knew the difference between the sleight of hand or the turn of a mirror or smoking mirrors or whatever else they call the things uh, and a real miracle a real episode of uh, power that has come from on high into this world and does things that are supernatural, above what is natural for us to see or for us to, uh, or for us to have seen. So, 
Here we, we have Philip and these men and women believing and being baptized. So, again, armed with what we know about the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit being received on a genuine baptism, a genuine faith and a genuine repentance, they had received the Holy Spirit. But it wasn't the miraculous power of the Spirit. That's the, that's the point I'd like to make. It wasn't the miraculous power of the Spirit. Verse 14, now when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Now, sometimes in the reading of this, and without the background that we already have, people would think, well, they, were, they believed and they repented, but they hadn't got the Holy Spirit because he had to pray for them to receive the Spirit. Now, that, that was, even for me, that was a genuine concern when I first was reading the book of Acts. And, uh, uh, and it's because I didn't have the background that I've just given you that made me question this. But... The point is, he prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. And it says in verse 16, For he had not yet fallen upon any of them, they had simply been baptized in the name of our Lord Jesus. Now what he means by this is, that they would simply been baptized, they had the indwelling of the Spirit, but they didn't have the miraculous power of the Spirit. Or the powers that come through the miraculous gift of the Spirit. It hadn't fallen on any of them. They'd just been baptized. Verse 17, and then they began, this is the apostles, began laying their hands on them and they were receiving the Holy Spirit. But we have to read into this the miraculous power of the Holy Spirit because it says, now when Simon saw that the Spirit was bestowed through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money. It was like in Acts chapter 19, when he laid his hands on those disciples, they received the Holy Spirit, but they began to speak in tongues and prophesy. Obviously, the miraculous power of the Spirit. It doesn't say that they were speaking in tongues and prophesying, but it implies that they were, because here Simon sees things that he hasn't seen them do before. And these were things in keeping with what he admired when he saw Philip working these gifts. Now Simon saw that the Spirit was bestowed through the laying on of the apostles' hands. Verse 18 is very crucial. He saw that the Spirit was bestowed through the laying on of the apostles' hands and he offered them money. Now notice Philip was there. But Philip couldn't put his hands on anybody to bestow the Holy Spirit on them. He had the gifts because the apostles uh, in Acts chapter 6 had laid their hands on him. And he had miraculous gifts as a result of that. He was now down in Samaria and he was preaching and confirming the word by the signs that he performed. So... He is not able to lay his hands on them. Only the apostles from Jerusalem were able to lay their hands on them and impart the miraculous power of the Holy Spirit to them. He wanted this authority. He wanted, he wanted to, to buy it. Now his mind has gone back to his old ways here. He, he very soon slipped from his, from his standing as a Christian into the old ways, the fleshly mind once more. He wanted to buy this so that he would have that power, so that he could get that glory and use it. He knew how to use this to, to enhance his own image, to get the attention, maybe even to milk the people for money. Uh, so he thought, this is an ideal opportunity. And of course, Peter told him off, big time, and told him to repent of the thought of his heart because he'd have no portion with them in this, uh, in this matter. Uh, his heart was not right before God. But the point I'm trying to make, and I hope I'm making it clearly enough here, 
is that we have not only the indwelling of the Spirit, but now the laying on of hands measure of the Spirit. Just to finish this point off, let's go to 2 Timothy 1 verse 6. Paul reminds Timothy, For this reason I remind you to kindle afresh the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and discipline. Timothy, as a, an evangelist, was able to work miracles. He doesn't specify which, what, what miracles he was working or what miracle he was working, but it was a gift of God which he had received. He had to kindle that afresh, which indicates that the use of the gifts would, uh, would be linked to the faith of the individual. If that faith takes a dip, the power also takes a dip with it. So there would be times when uh, the, the, the flame was not burning that brightly. And he says, kindle afresh the flame so that the, the, the would, you would get the full benefit and everybody would be blessed by that full benefit of the gift that was in him through the laying on of the apostles' hands. Of course, they would have to learn in the early days, as we do in the present day, that miraculous gifts, as great as they were, and they were great gifts, would not buy you into heaven on its own. I think there's so many people in the religious world think because they have they claim to have a miraculous gift, that that just guarantees that they are acceptable before God and is the proof to them that, uh, that the way they're living or what they're doing or the way they're worshipping is all just right with God and they're right with God and everything's right in the world because of that situation. So just look at Matthew chapter 7. This is Jesus himself speaking here. Beginning with verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name cast out demons? And in your name perform many miracles? <coughs> now listen to this, verse 23. Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. You had no authority for what you were doing. You weren't doing it for me. You were doing it for yourself. And if the present day is anything to go on, it was how they deceived themselves in these matters. Even the deception that if I had a miraculous gift, it proved I was acceptable before God. Unless you are being obedient to God, submissive to God's will, doing God's command, keeping God's commandments, no matter what gift you had, you were not going to be saved. Depart from me, Jesus says. Very strong, very, very strong language. And should sound out a great warning to everyone on this matter. Now, the third um, measure of the Spirit that we want to look at is uh, the baptism of the Spirit. The baptism of the Spirit. Matthew chapter 3, if you're in Matthew now, just go back to chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3, 5 through 11. 
Then Jerusalem was going out to him and all Judea and all the district around the Jordan and they were being baptized by him in the Jordan River as they confessed their sins. And when he saw, this is John the Baptist now, when he saw the Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore bear fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not suppose that you can say to yourselves, we have, we have Abraham for our father. For I say to you that from these stones God is able to raise up children to Abraham. The axe is already laid at the root of the tree. Therefore every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. As for me, I baptize you with water for repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, and I am not fit to remove his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire, it says. Now, apart from the fact that many uh, people think the baptism of the Holy Spirit and fire is one and the same thing, I don't believe in the context that, that, it, that it is. I believe that, um, as he says in the very next verse, his winnowing fork is in his hands, he will thoroughly cleanse his threshing floor, and he will gather his wheat into the barn, and he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. So he's able to not only save, but he's able also to destroy. Uh, but it does seem from this passage of scripture, I have to admit that when again I came across it first, that it was, John was indicating uh, that this baptism of the Holy Spirit was for everybody. That it was for everybody. Well, let's say, say it was. Let's say that's what we think. Now let's move on in the Bible and see if the Bible proves our, um, our guess to be right. And that's what you have to do with some of these things. You, you just have to test what you've uh, concluded yourself and see, well, does the rest of the Bible support this? And if it doesn't, you have to revisit what you have concluded and you've got to adjust it to what the whole Bible is teaching or to what other passages are teaching. When it actually came down to it, um, we know from John chapter 14, And in verse 26, he says, but the helper, and he's talking, this is uh, in the upper room from chapter 13 uh, up to uh, chapter 16, the end of chapter 16, um, and maybe <coughs> included 17, the prayer of our Lord Jesus. Uh, all, of, all of this was, took place in the upper room when they were having the Passover. There were only the 11 disciples, because Judas had gone out, uh, and Jesus himself there. And he made the promise to them uh, in verse 26, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. Who's going to send this Holy Spirit? The Father's going to send this Holy Spirit. Who is he promising the Spirit to at this time? point he's promising it to the Jewish apostles and of course the, it was specifically given to the, to the uh, apostles in order to bring to their remembrance all that Jesus had said to them so that when they were preaching and teaching about what Jesus might have said years ago they weren't relying on their own memory they were relying on the Holy Spirit to bring it back to them as to what was actually said and what was done at each stage in Christ's life and ministry. All right, so um, we, we move on um, because in Acts chapter 1, after the resurrection, We 
We're told in verses 4 and 5, And gathering them together, he commanded them, this is just before he ascends into heaven, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which he said, you heard of from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So again, Jesus is saying to them, right, I'm going up to heaven. Uh, I will send the Holy Spirit to you. You are to wait in Jerusalem until you're endued with power from on high. Uh, and uh, you're to wait there until the promise of the Father uh, comes upon you. He says, John baptized with water. Now he's directly linking what he's about to do for these apostles with what John the Baptist said. John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Jesus is the one who baptizes in the Spirit. And that Spirit is sent without mediation. In other words, no laying on of hands or anything. In the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it comes directly from heaven. Directly from heaven. This is an important feature because it distinguishes it from the laying on of hands measure and it distinguishes it from the indwelling which came through faith and baptism. So they waited in Jerusalem and then were told the story in Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues as a fire distributing themselves and resting on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. Now there were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the crowd came together and were bewildered because they were each one hearing them speak in his own language. Why am I emphasizing this? Because when we talk about tongue speaking to people today, they're not talking about speaking a foreign language which they've never learned, an ability to be able to praise God and to thank God in a foreign language that they had never learned. They're talking about a babel, a babble, a babble, not anything else. Not anything else. They're not talking about what the Bible is talking about when it speaks about tongues that is speaking in their own language and hearing them in their own language in which they were born. And it lists people from various parts of the world and uh, it says in verse 11, we hear them in our own tongues speaking of the mighty deeds of God and they all continued in amazement and great perplexity saying to one another, what does this mean? All right, so here's a definite now in regard to the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which John says Christ would perform when Christ came. And here now Jesus, after going back to heaven, sends the Holy Spirit upon them on the day of Pentecost. Now, because of Matthew, you would think if the baptism of the Holy Spirit is for everywhere, everyone, then it would have been emphasized and re-emphasized and made very clear throughout the rest of the scripture. Now the baptism of the Holy Spirit is only spoken of twice. It's spoken of here and then in the household of Cornelius who were the first Gentile converts to the gospel. We remember that episode uh, Peter went into a trance, he saw, uh, he saw a sheet coming down out of heaven and in it were all these unclean animals and uh, God told him, arise uh, and eat. And Peter objected, I've never eaten anything unclean in my life. And this happened three times. Then the messengers came to, to say Cornelius had seen an angel, he wanted them to come down and to tell them the words of salvation or the words of life. And uh, so uh, Peter goes down, 
He brings some witnesses with him, Jewish witnesses, because he knows now there's going to be problems with the Jews when he comes back because he's going to a Gentile home. He goes into the, uh, into the home and uh, he suddenly reads, it dawns on him what he'd been preaching from the very beginning that the promise is to you and to your children and to all those who are far off, as many as the Lord our God shall call to himself. He realizes what he was saying there. He understood for the first time that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he who does what is right or what is pleasing to him is acceptable to him. And he preaches and, uh, to the people about Jesus. And uh, let's have a look at it in Acts chapter 10 here. Oh. I'll finish up just now. I won't hold you too much longer. In verse 43 it says, Of him all the prophets, this is what uh, Peter is saying to them, Of him, of Jesus, all the prophets bear witness that through his name everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who were listening to the message. All the, un the circumcised believers who came with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. For they were hearing them speaking with tongues and exalting God. Then Peter answered, Surely no one can refuse the water for these to be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as, uh, just as we did. Can he? And he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ and they asked him to stay on for a few days. Jump down to chapter 11 where Peter is explaining to the Jews when he gets back what had, what had happened. It says, uh, verse 14, And he will speak words to you by which you will be saved, you and all your household. And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them, just as he did upon us at the beginning. Now, if the baptism of the Holy Spirit was a daily occurrence, why did John, or Peter, sorry, have to go back to the very beginning to get another instance of the baptism of the Holy Spirit just as he did on us at the beginning and I remember the words of the Lord how he used to say John baptized with water but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit so now he's definitely affirming that what happened here in the household of Cornelius was similar to what had happened on the day of Pentecost it was a baptism of the Holy Spirit but it was for a very different reason in the sense that it was a witness from God to uh, Peter and all of the Jews and to Cornelius that the faith that they had, these Gentiles had, was acceptable in God's sight. And now all they had to do was to be baptized to become Christians. Nothing more than that. No circumcision, no addressing the law of Moses, nothing to do with any of that, only faith repentance and baptism so these are the two accounts of the baptism of the Holy Spirit Really and truly, this is the simplest way that I know of, of unraveling the strands which have been twisted in the present day, getting us back to what the scripture teaches, and putting it in a simple way so that everybody can understand it. Those who have believed, those who have repented and were baptized, received the indwelling of the Spirit. He dwells in you. He proves that you are a son or a daughter of God. The laying on of hands measure of the Spirit was the miraculous measure of the Spirit. But that could only be done by the apostles. There are no living apostles today. The Spirit cannot be passed on in that way anymore. The baptism of the Holy Spirit was given to all men representatively in 
the apostles, Jewish apostles, and Gentile household of Cornelius, who became Christians as a result of the witness that God had given to their heart to Peter and the others. And that's it. That wasn't for everybody, nor should we be looking for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I hope this helps you. It might not be what you've ever heard before. It might even go against what you want to believe. But it's what the Bible teaches. In other words, it's from the mouth of God. It's not Steve Carney who's making this up. I found this in the scriptures. If you study it, you'll find it in the scriptures. Take down these scriptures and read it for yourself. And you will see that what is said here is the truth. Let's follow the truth at all costs. No matter how uncomfortable <coughs> it might make us feel. I'll leave it with you. Thank you.